afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the country. I'm on the East Coast, so it's just about lunchtime for me. Um, again, welcome. We're going to be talking about the KT3 today, and uh, this is part two of the overview series. We had the first one uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, hopefully, you all were able to attend that. If not, you can go to the website and actually just uh, view the recording. I want to apologize before we get started. I'm at the, uh, hopefully, fighting the tail end of which it, what is my last sinus, sinus infection of the of the year. So if I have a strange voice, um, hopefully it's not too annoying for you as you're listening in today. Um, again, let's get started here. We have the KT3, if you weren't uh, familiar with or haven't heard of it coming out. It will be coming out soon. It's uh, coming out in the spring of this year. So uh, we have all this uh, coming out really, really soon, and hopefully you'll be able to hear some information today that helps you make a decision about whether or not this is the uh, the uh, achievement test uh, that's right for you. And I think you're going to find that uh, the KT3 does have some unique advantages, and I'm going to be able to talk about a lot of those today. So um, please just please just stay tuned to that. This is our agenda. We are going to be talking about how the KT3 does measure um, all of the eight specific areas of learning disability and IDEA, um, as well as the areas of impairment in the DSM-5. We're also going to talk about how the KT3 Helps, helps you as the evaluator answer questions of underachievement and also allows you to um, select interventions that are going to be best to address the student needs. And, you know, that's really going to come through a very targeted model, uh, strengths and weaknesses model of assessment, and I think you'll see that as we go along today. We're going to then hit on the uh, KT3 parent, teacher, and child intervention suggestions. Um, this is a system that will make suggestions on interventions based on student performance. Um, and I think that's a real benefit to this uh, to this test. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the relationship to the Common Core State Standards and um, what tests will measure parts of the Common Core State Standards. We're also going to talk about some of the uh, you know some of the benefits to that and some of of course the limitations to do, to using the KT3 for something like that. And then uh, finally at the end I will talk very briefly. Uh, we don't have a lot of information on this stuff yet. Um, and of course some of it's still in development that will be coming out after. Um, um, publication of the test, but I know some of you have, may have heard about an upcoming COMBA report, and I will talk a little bit about what that means, um, just some, some reporting features of the, um, the, the software that, that QGlobal will, will be using. So let's get started. Um, what is the KT3, just in case you don't or have not heard about it yet or have not seen this type of a slide before? It is uh, the Kaufman Test of Educational Achievement. It is, this is the third edition of it. Um, it's an individually administered measure of academic achievement, and this is for grades pre-K through 12 or ages uh, 4 through 25 years. And of course, that's a, that's a, a, a downward extension um, by about six months. So the KT2 um, uh, went through 4, 6 through 25, and um, the KT3 now goes from 4. I'm going to review some of the core composites and subtests and how um, the, these tests will um, they align to this different um, composites. And the reason I'm doing this is to really show you some, just to give you an understanding of the, the organization of the test, and then I'm going to really get into what, what all this means later on. But I want to show you the, the basic structure of how these um, composites and how the test is formulated. So right here we're looking at um, basically the academic skills battery is made up of reading, writing, and math. And you can see that the writing, the reading composite will be made up of letter and word recognition and reading comprehension. The math composite will be made up of math concepts and application as well as computation. And written language will be um, the written expression subtest as well as spelling. And all of those lead into or uh, allow you to formulate the academic skills battery, which is basically, if you think of it as a general academic um, functioning composite. Okay, So that's sort of the general or the full-scale sort of academic composite. There are some reading-related subtests and composites here, and you can see it's broken down. It really allows you to analyze reading um, in a very detailed manner. Uh, you can see the sound-symbol relationship is um, in, uh, composite is measured by phonological processing and then nonsense word decoding. Uh, we're able to look at decoding by looking at letter and word recognition as well as the nonsense word decoding subtest. Reading understanding is made up of reading comprehension and reading vocabulary. And reading fluency is made up, made up of word recognition fluency. Then there's a decoding as well as a silent reading fluency. So there, we have some additional um, reading fluency tests there that make up, that really allow you to break down fluency in a little bit more of a detailed fashion. 
The oral language subtests and composites are made up of oral fluency and then, of course, of oral language. And we see oral fluency is associational as well as object naming uh, facility. Uh, oral language is going to be made up of the associational fluency, uh, listening comprehension, and oral expression subtests. And this is the last sub, uh, the last slide I wanted to show you, basically, of some of the, the comp composites, which really this is a, a, a just an example of the cross-domain subtest. So we really are able to um, really are able to see this in a little bit more detail with uh, looking at some cross-domain um, issues. And those uh, are orthographic processing. You know, this is really important for us to to analyze when we're um, looking at reading difficulties. Um, we're, we're breaking it down by spelling, letter name naming facility, and word recognition fluency. You are able to look at a general academic fluency um, composite, and you know th these types of things. Uh, fluency in general, uh, as you all know, and when when a child has a difficulty with fluency in one academic area, it is also important to to measure fluency in general and uh, across several different academic areas because you know a fluency is made up of two different things basically, which uh, one is going to be the skill, which is the academic skill, and then second is going to be um, inhibition uh, or disinhibition, uh, an, an, an executive function executive control. So um, if somebody has difficulty with that executive function, they may have difficulty across all areas of fluency or may not. So the academic fluency um, area is going to be one area where you're going to really find a lot of meaning um, when you're looking at fluency specifically. We're breaking down expression. Um, you know, I, I, I do speak about uh, a language to speech pathologists a lot, a lot about um, language tests that we have. And one of the key components of a, of a, of a language test just for your for your information, is looking at expression and breaking it down based on oral and written language. And um, I think that that's a strength, whether or not you're using speech and language or doing a language evaluation, as well as an academic uh, achievement evaluation. So the ability to look at expression in general and then break it and compare it to um, written and oral language is really important uh, for a child or for a young adult in, in their learning. And then we're able to look here at comprehension, and of course this is both um, oral and um, written comprehension again. Again, this is sort of a, an offshoot of what I was just talking about with uh, with written language or with uh, speech and language. But um, we're able to look at receptive language, and we're able to look at uh, receptive written language. So we have reading and listening comprehension there as well. I do see a question here that just came through. Um, I apologize; I should have addressed this before I got started. But in terms of a uh, handout, a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, I did send that out this morning, so um, I sent out a, a reminder or a, an update email this morning, and I think it was around 9.30 Eastern I sent that out. So um, you all should have or you all did receive that email. Um, look on the right-hand side under Downloadable Files and just click the link to the handout. Uh, you may want to also check your spam filters because sometimes our emails, those updates will get caught in a spam filter if you're in a school or something like that. Um, but if you don't have it, it should be coming to you or you should have it, um, you know, in your box because it was sent out uh, about two and a half, three hours ago. Okay, so um, just moving on. I did want to talk a little bit about how the KT3 um, um, really lines up to the areas of, of achievement as, uh, you know, delineated in the in IDEA uh, so it's really important for us to really think about this and, and break this down because we need to be able to, in order to verify or diagnose a learning disability in schools, we need to be able to break it down and look at each of these areas of achievement, right? So the KT3 allows us to do that, and um, this chart here really does show how that works out for us. Um, for um, IDEA, if we're looking at oral expression, of course there are oral expression tests here. There's an oral expression specific test on KT3. Uh, for listening comprehension, again, there's a specific test for that. In terms of basic reading skills, so looking at the area of basic reading skills, there are four that I've listed here that, uh, that correspond um, based on KT3. So we have letter and word recognition, nonsense word decoding, reading composite, and then the decoding composite, composite also can be used. And, you know, we're also we're looking in most cases for multiple areas or multiple points of data. So for the subtests or for the um, areas that have multiple uh, multiple subtests listed, so uh, such as basic reading skills and, and reading comprehension and so forth. We do have multiple data points that you're able to use here. Now, for the other ones, um, this is a really important single data point um, uh, looking at um, skill performance or test performance. 
But you're also, in these cases, suggested to also find other points of data, such as observation or classroom artifacts, et cetera. So, uh, you know, you, you want to be able to find additional information in, that, in these cases. Um, you're going to also want to look at additional information in the cases of multiple data points for the, from the KT3, but you are able to find um, multiple supporting areas. All right, so when we're looking at reading comprehension, it's broken down and we're able to look at both the reading comprehension subtest and the reading understanding composite, which is uh, important. Reading fluency, again, I kind of went over that a little bit before, but we have a word recognition, decoding, um, silent reading fluencies, and then the reading fluency comp composite. For written expression, we're able to look at the written expression subtest as well as the composite calculation. We do have that computation subtest as well as the fluency test. Um, because, you know, in the math fluency subtests are basic calculation, um, requires basic calculation. And then under problem solving, we have the concepts and application subtest. So really the point to show you here is that, um, you know, KT3 has uh, multiple areas uh, looking at each of the, um, multiple subtests looking at each of the areas of, uh, of achievement on the idea. Okay, I did want to show you also how KT3 can co uh, corresponds to the DSM-5 in terms of clinical diagnostics. Um, it's really important that we are able to find, again, points of data when ma we're making diagnostic uh, decisions clinically. And um, KT3 has a, a number of areas it aligns, just like it did with IDEA, um, to make these, uh, these decisions. So when we're looking at impairments in reading, um, the DSM-5 specific areas are word reading accuracy, uh, reading rate or fluency, and reading comprehension. And again, you see them all corresponding here on the right-hand side. Uh, in terms of impairment in written expression, uh, DSM-5 is looking at spelling accuracy, grammar and punctu punctuation accuracy, and clarity or organization of written expression. And we see um, them listed over here. For written expression, we're really looking at structure, word form, and punctuation error analysis categories. So you're able to not only analyze the written expression subtest, but also break down the errors to, to look a little bit more specifically at some of these weaknesses that correspond to diagnosis, diagnoses of learning disability. Um, and for this last one, clarity organization of written expression, we're breaking down the written expression subtest and looking at specifically the essay item for this, uh, for this correspondence. When you're looking at number sense in terms of impairments in math, um, uh, looking at the math concepts and application subtest, and specifically looking at number concepts, error analysis, and breaking down that error analysis again. For memorization of arithmetic facts, we have um, uh, math fluency subtests, and uh, we're also able to look at the math computation, factor computation, um, error analysis. And then you see accurate or fluent calculation and also accurate math reasoning also do correspond to specific subtests. I do want to show you this. Uh, I like this. Um, I like this this chart. Uh, the reason is because sometimes we're we're looking for um, correspondence with tests that we give to theories that we uh, learning theories that we're we are um, associated with or that we we tend to um, use as our philosophies. And CHC or otherwise known Cattell Horn Carroll or otherwise known as GFGC is a very popular learning theory um, theory of cognition and learning. And uh, oftentimes when when, when clinicians, uh, myself as a psychologist or educational um, diagnosticians or educators, are looking for specific correspondence, a one-to-one -one correspondence with a subtest and a, a, a domain in CHC, sometimes that's hard to find and you have to kind of uh, make a leap in terms of where that is. Uh, with KT3, there are specific, um, we have some specific mapping here, and there are, again, other subtests in the manual that will help you make that, that determination. So if you're looking to make those, um, those, those uh, make a diagnosis or be able to interpret performance or interpret um, sort of the global child or looking at global skills uh, based on CHC, you can do that, um, and the, the tables are there for you to, to be able to do that. But I just wanted to give you one, one little one here to kind of give you an example of that. Um, you see that for oral language subtests, you have listening comprehension in oral expression, and they specifically load to um, the broad, cat broad domain of GC and the narrow of uh, uh, listening ability and communication ability. Uh, when you're looking at reading subtests, the letter word, uh, word, I'm sorry, letter word recognition, reading comprehension, silent reading fluency, and reading vocabulary all load on GRW, uh, G reading and writing, and then also um, silent reading fluency loads on GS, which is basically processing speed. 
Um, again, you're looking a little bit more in detail uh, in the narrow bands on the right. But hopefully what this is showing you is that um, we have uh, some good correspondence and some good uh, lineup here that really helps us be able to answer questions uh, regardless of what specific learning theory you, you subscribe to. Um, and I know that that's sometimes hard to do when we're, when we're looking at um, various tests of achievement and cognitive abilities. The other one I wanted to show you here is KT3 and information processing, because um, information processing is another area where uh, we are looking at, um, you know, specific learning theory. We're looking at how, how kids are processing information and um, based on the input processing and then the output. And I think that uh, when you're when you're choosing an academic achievement test or when you're trying to figure out what to use, um, KT3 will be helpful for you in this in this regard as well. So. What I wanted to show you is just this little slide uh, looking at uh, listening comprehension to kind of show you what, what we're talking about. And again, you see that little, little uh, notation on the bottom right that other subtests are, of course, going to be in the manual as well. But in terms of listening comprehension, you know, the input for listening comprehension, are, they're going to be brief oral directions, and there's auditory and verbal input. Um, the early items that on this subtest are going to be spoken, and the later items are going to be an audio recording. So that input is going to be Oral directions, you're going to be hearing it auditorily, uh, and then they're going to be verbal. Um, the processing of that, uh, you're going to, uh, you know, there's language comprehension and listening ability. Um, it's going to be requiring uh, sequential processing, and uh, there's some auditory verbal working memory um, processing happening there and some requirement there. There's also some executive functioning um, being, um, being loaded here, which are sustained attention, um, details, short-term memory for details, we're looking at discrimination of essential and non-essential information. And then the output here is a brief oral response, which is a verbal response, and then there's open-ended and multiple choice questions. So what's happening is, um, you know, on a subtest like listening comprehension, what this really is helping us see is that um, we're able to break down and look at where, what's required for the subtest. So if a child has difficulty with listening comprehension, we need to be able to break down and look at where exactly that, that, that fault is happening. Is it happening with the processing in the middle, which is really what we're kind of looking at, right? We're looking at this acquired achievement a little bit more. When we're interpreting the listening comprehension subtest, we're looking at that, that achievement in a little bit more detail, right? So if somebody has, um, if somebody has a, a difficulty on this test and they, they get a low score, um, should we necessarily always just interpret that as being a listening comprehension weakness? Well, we may or we may not. We're going to have to take into account what the input and output of that test are as well and whether or not a child has any difficulty with those two areas or with any of the other um, requirement required um, skills or functions of the test. So do they have difficulty with sustained attention? If yes, well, maybe they're going to have a little bit of difficulty with listening comprehension in general. So what I think that this, this really shows us, and, I, and one of the reasons I really like looking at it this way, is that um, it, it's just, uh, y you know, we're really able to break down a subtest and, and think about what is making up performance of that subtest. So hopefully this will be helpful to you all. I know that it will be uh, to me, um, um, and I think, that, uh, I think that you'll like really looking at tests in this manner um, and then really interpreting performance in this manner as well. Okay, in terms of the KT3 evaluation, what does this mean? Well, the KT3 does have measures of academic achievement as well as some related areas of cognitive processing, and that's really to provide you with information about why a student may be struggling academically and then really how to, thinking about how best to intervene in those situations. Now, in some cases, it's going to be helpful for you to supplement KT3 uh, with one or more tests of cognitive processing or, or intellectual ability. So. If you are doing this in terms of an arena assessment or an assessment with other um, um, other professionals in the school or what have you in the clinic, um, it may be helpful for you all to collaborate on other tests of cognitive processing, really or into, uh, or, or IQ or intellectual ability to really think about where that breakdown happens. So you see what I was talking a little bit before about um, CHC or even um, the DSM or even the information processing. In some of those cases, if you're finding weaknesses, you may need further information from other tests to be able to drive that, okay? Um, another, so let me just give you an example. Um, 
when you're considering a comprehensive evaluation really, in the situation where you're trying to determine if a, a student has a developmental disability or a specific learning disability, it's really going to be important to, to evaluate all five domains of development. So you may want to think about cognition, language, expressive and receptive language, gross and fine motor, adaptive functioning, uh, and social-emotional functioning as well. So that's just one quick area where you really need, you need to think about that. But the other example is um, you may need to break down and, and get tests of at attention and executive functioning, such as in this example here, or working memory. Okay, so I just really want to reiterate that to you, that the KT3 evaluation um, does, in some cases, require you to supplement um, to get a full picture of a child's ability or where the breakdown is occurring. Okay, so let's talk about the process for selecting what subtest to administer. Okay, this is a really um, this is a really great part of our conversation today, and hopefully that when you're thinking about what to give, um, you may be in a situation where you are you know you're required to give certain subtests, but you know, generally, when you're an evaluator, you want to be able to specify and look a little bit more in detail at specific things that are specific strengths, specific weaknesses that really are going to help you drive your decisions and um, and make more effective interventions, really driving the, the effective interventions. So let's talk a little bit about this now. But when we're thinking about selecting um, subtests, there, there are some guidance for selecting KT3 subtests based on specific reasons for referral, such as comp if you're going to do a comprehensive evaluation or weakness if there's a weakness in a specific academic area, such as writing, math, or reading. The subtests are going to be suggested for you um, for, for t testing hypotheses about certain subtypes of learning problems um, and processing, processing weaknesses that may be contributing to academic difficulties. So the this, this suggestions that you're going to get when you actually um, look for guidance, and this information is going to be provided for you in the manual, so you, can, you actually have a reference for, for this guidance. Um, they're not really prescriptive. Um, in most cases, the su subtest selection will change as you do your ongoing assessment. And that's, the reason for that is because you're going to have to confirm or refute hypotheses and rule in or rule out theories as you go along. So uh, when you get the suggestions for, for, for subtests to test hypotheses, um, don't just give those and, and not think about them. Give the tests that, that are suggested to you, but also think about what other information you may need as well. So what exactly is a comprehensive, comprehensive versus a targeted evaluation? Well, um, wait, what slide are we on here? Sorry, I'm, uh, okay, 15, sorry. I lost my slide count, no, my, my slide number. Um, in terms of comprehensive versus targeted evaluation, when we're looking at the evaluation uh, of areas of strengths and weaknesses, it's really important for you to uh, plan for individualized interventions rather than assessing only areas of weakness. So when we think about um, looking at a targeted evaluation, we're going to need to thoroughly evaluate um, or, I mean, a comprehensive evaluation, we're going to need to thoroughly evaluate strengths and weaknesses, um, not only what they do well, but also what they do poorly and what they have difficulty with. So in these cases, we are suggesting a comprehensive evaluation, um, really to evaluate for possible learning disorders and for Tier 3 evaluations in an RTI model. However, when we think about comprehensive evaluations, they may not be needed when you already have other assessment data or other area, in other areas of academics. So if you have um, Tier 1 and Tier 2 information, if you're in an RTI format or an RTI system that has good information about the strengths that they have and, and um, some, of the, some of the things that the, the child does well, you may only need to look at specific areas of weakness and then really compare those results to the areas that they do well in. So that's just one area where you might not need to do comprehensive. Another, another time is when um, you're screening. Um, so in, in times when you need to do a screening, you can give specific um, specific targeted um, um, subtests to be able to look at specific areas. And also, um, just to think about it, uh, for these purposes, a more targeted assessment plan may be warranted. So um, if you are looking at specific areas of weakness for a screening um, or for, you know, Tier 3 or what have you, if you're looking targeted and if you're looking at a more targeted evaluation, meaning really taking out specific subtests, 
that's going to really allow you to um, make specific recommendations or specific interventions, okay? You're not going to be able to make general learning interventions or learning interventions made based on um, strengths and weaknesses. You're really going to have to be very specific and very targeted. So let's talk about what is the process for a referral for a comprehensive evaluation. So in this situation, when you're using the KT3, you're going to administer the subtests that are required for the academic skills battery, so that all the, the um, the six subtests that I talked about before, all of the subtests required for the oral language composite. Okay, at nearly every age and grade, all the subtests that that are included in both those composites will yield each of the domain composites that are available. Okay, so we have um, for the examinee's age or grade. So, looking at both of those composites, you're able to um, get a a large amount of information for uh, the comprehensive evaluation. When you're doing a comprehensive eval, or when would you? It would, we are generally recommending that for students who are presenting with a weakness in one or more academic areas. Again, what you're going to have to do here is, though, think about whether KT3 may need to be supplemented uh, with other norm reference tests and measures. So just keep going back to that, whether or not you need to have additional information in addition to KT3. This is an, an example. Um, I do want to give you a couple examples here of specific um, um, specific subtests that we're going to recommend based on specific weaknesses. So I'm going to go over reading difficulties here. Um, there are also going to be suggestions based on writing and math difficulties and, and so forth. Um, but I'm just going to give you a little snapshot here uh, to see what it looks like. But in terms of the referral for reading difficulties, if you have a child coming to you with that, we do strongly recommend that you give the letter word recognition and the reading comprehension subtests. Um, um, in terms of um, for if a child has word recognition weaknesses, we're recommending phonological processing, nonsense word decoding, spelling, word recognition fluency, and letter naming facility, and also associational fluency. Um, you see here for comprehension weaknesses, we're suggesting listening comprehension and reading vocabulary. Um, and in uh, for fluency weaknesses, recommending silent reading fluency, word recognition fluency, and decoding fluency, and then also math fluency, writing fluency, and decoding fluency. Again, looking at all academic fluency in general. Um, for reading referrals, we're looking for all reading referrals. Um, we're suggesting that you evaluate verbal reasoning, perceptual reasoning, verbal working memory, and areas of executive functioning. Looking at inhibition um, specifically, and you're going to use behavioral observations on the KT3 and/or administer other norm reference tests. So. You see, this is just really a snapshot or an example of what it looks like. Um, what it looks like when you see the information coming on KT3, um, the suggestions that you're going to be able to to look for. So, um, I think that um, I think that this is really going to be helpful for you. Um, it's going to be a way that you can drive um, your assessment in a little bit more of a focused manner. Um, but in terms of this bottom section down here too, it also allows you to think about what other data points you're going to need to be able to thoroughly evaluate reading. Um, it's really important that we don't leave these types of things out as well, or at least account for them in our, in our overall formulations. We do have some, this is uh, another couple sections, I have a couple slides here that are reading referral questions related to KT3 subtests. So I'm just going to go over these in general and kind of give you a, a sense of what exactly you're going to be answering or what kinds of questions you can answer with a specific subtest. So for letter and word recognition, again, I want to just say I'm going to go over reading now. There are going to be other areas um, in the manual for the test, but I just want to go over reading now to give you an understanding of what you're going to see. But for letter and word recognition, um, the question that you're going to be, be asking here is how well does the student read real words under untimed con conditions? In this situation, you're going to compare performance on sight words, uh, and words with unpredictable patterns of regular words. Okay, so for reading comprehension, the question that you're going to be having here is, how well does the student comprehend literal and infer inferential information from written narrative and expository passages? Okay, so hopefully you're getting a sense of, you know, these are questions that are going to be coming through in referral, um, specific questions if you have a very detailed team working, if you have a lot of information coming from earlier in the, the um, RTI process. A lot of this stuff should be very targeted, and you're going to see these tests can be used to answer those specific uh, questions. Um, 
you see here, this is the next one. If you have reading comprehension skills that are weak, we're recommending that you also consider to administer the, lead, the listening comprehension and reading vocabulary tests, like, like I talked about before. But the questions that are coming from listening comprehension, um, how well does the student comprehend literal and inferential information from oral narrative and expository passages? Are comprehension weaknesses general, or are they specific to reading? So are we looking at uh, language comprehension in general or specific reading comprehension? Um, with reading vocabulary, we're looking at um, how well can the student identify or infer the meaning of words he or she reads. In the situation of performance is weak, you're going to consider interpreting or evaluating oral receptive vocabulary as well. For phonological processing, the questions that, you, that um, you're able to answer, uh, does the student, does the question you're able to answer is, does the student demonstrate weaknesses in areas of phonological processing that might be contributing to decoding and spelling problems? For the nonsense word decoding, how well does the student, how well is the student able to decode unfamiliar words? Uh, in an associational fluency, we're asking, we're able to answer, um, are there weaknesses in fluent word retrieval that might be contributing to word, to reading problems? And for word recognition fluency, how fluently, and we're looking at quickly and accurately, can the student read real words under timed conditions? Are weaknesses in word identification primarily in speed, accuracy, or both? Okay, and this is the last subtest we'll talk about with regard to the reading referral questions, but I just wanted to show you these to kind of give you a sense, again, that you're able to look at um, specific correspondence and answer questions that you're getting for reading referrals based on specific performances that you, you, a child is having on subtests. Again, decoding fluency. Um, how fluently, quickly and accurately, again, can the student decode nonsense words under time conditions? Um, for spelling, how, w how well can the student spell regular and irregular words? And do spelling errors suggest weaknesses in phonological and or orthographic awareness? Uh, and silent reading fluency test. How quickly and accurately can a student read and comprehend words in context? And then what you're going to do here is uh, you'll choose one of these, again, based on age or letter uh, knowledge. But letter naming facility, uh, does the student have a rapid naming weakness that contributes to word identification and reading fluency problems? Or um, object naming facility um, for preschool and young elementary grades, is the student at risk for learning disabilities or reading disorder? Okay. Do have some questions coming through. Um, I'm going to try to answer some of those as we go, but I'm going to try to also, if I have some time at the end, I'll be able to get to those as well, folks. All right, I do want to talk about this subject here, um, qualitative indicators. So what exactly are qualitative indicators? Uh, well, their ob observations of test-taking behavior are intended to provide qualitative information that can really help you develop um, either or confirm or refute hypotheses about factors affecting a child's test performance. Um, qualitative observations that are included for KT3 are not quite exhaustive, and you'll be encouraged to record other observations that may be diagnostically relevant. Um, but basically what it helps you do is it helps you identify or look for specific um, characteristics or specific behaviors that are qualitatively linked to specific areas of weakness. Um, what I do want to talk about here is that hypotheses suggested by the observations that you get or the observations that you make should be cross-validated with other test data um, or non-test data that you get from other classroom observations or things like reports from your teachers or from parents before you make any decisions based on them. So there are going to be qualitative indicators included in KT3 that are going to help you make um, or confirm, uh, refute hypotheses, but they may not be exhaustive. So think about um, also including other observations that you may have that may be important to you. Um, when you think about this, though, in, in this way, um, qualitative and quantitative information can really work together for the benefit of the child or the examinee that you're, that you're testing. And we're really looking at multiple points of data, mo looking at not just the test score, but also looking at what behaviors are um, they're, they're, they have during the testing session, but other points of data observations that you're making in the classroom. In terms of qualitative indicators in Q Global, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Q Global later on, but Q Global is the uh, is the online scoring and reporting software that um, KT3 will be, will be using. Um, KT3 uh, has 
information, so if you put in information in QGlobal, you are able to print out a report, again, a standard report, in the KT3 standard report that's provided when you do QGlobal. Subtest-specific qualitative observations are going to be entered for the core and the supplemental subtests in the areas of oral language, reading, writing, and math. They're going to be there. You don't have to include them, but they are going to be there for you to include. Um, language processing measures, including phonological processing, object naming facility, and letter naming facility are not going to be included. But basically the standard report that you're going to see will display the possible areas of cognitive processing weaknesses that are going to be suggested by qualitative observations. So whatever observations you make during the, during the assessment, if they are included here, it's going to suggest some areas of weakness or some areas of processing that you may want to think about evaluating further. This is an example of some of the, some of the, the questions that you may get. This is just an example, again, of oral expression, but the observations that you, these are the observations that you should be making during the test. So does the, does the uh, examinee respond? Were, there, were the responses often illogical or not meaningful? Um, did they have difficulty with the target words correctly? Did they respond impulsively? Uh, did they frequently revise or reformulate their response? Uh, did they have difficulty with word finding? Um, or were the responses often fragments or incomplete? So these types of observations are really going to help drive um, additional thoughts about what processing weaknesses a child may have. And this is an example summary of possible areas of cognitive processing weaknesses that are going to be suggested by those observations. So this is, again, just an example summary of some of these areas over here. You see some of the areas I've listed here on the left, the language or achievement area. So we know for oral expression, um, the areas that are shaded gray are not, the areas shaded gray here that you see are not, um, cor do not correspond to the area of uh, achievement. But the areas that are, are, are white or shaded, whatever this, this little uh, like shaded color is, are, are course, do correspond. So for oral expression, um, Specifically, you can see attention and executive functions, language processing, um, automaticity, and working memory all um, are linked to oral expression. So those are the things that we're going to be looking for. Um, the X that you see on the screen here, you see a few of the Xs, um, correspond to qualitative observations suggested um, they, that suggest the cognitive processing weakness or a possible weakness in that area. The shading, again, is an area that is not primarily involved in um, performance. Uh, in this situation, you cross-validate the information that's suggested by these observations with other sources of data, including other KT3 scores, error analysis results, and standard measures of cognitive processing. So, for example, in this situation, if I had, I see that, um, I see that this child had difficulty with language, pro uh, of beha or showed a behavior that links to language processing difficulties on oral expression, I may want to give another test or look at language processing in a little bit more detail or talk to the speech language pathologist about the child's language processing. Um, in, the diff in the areas such as basic reading, and we know that the child exhibited difficulties with automaticity or rapid automatic naming, there are other tests that we may want to look at rapid automatic naming um, on, looking at them in a little bit more detail. So you see how that works out? Um, based on the observations that, you, uh, that you're making, uh, when you actually print out, or when, actually, when you actually make the report in QGlobal, it's going to give you a, a table similar to this, um, where you're actually going to be able to look at the processing areas that the child may have difficulty with. Really being able to drive your, your evaluation in a little bit more detail um, and look at it a little bit more um, meaningfully. All right. Um, one of the things I did want to tell you about this, though, that I really like, um, professionally anyway. I teach a lot about um, talking about um, the link between test performance and functional outcomes or functional performance, right? So looking at that link between qualitative and quantitative information in an evaluation really allows you to be uh, much more um, effective and specific diagnostically and also be able to drive more effective interventions. So looking at it at this level with the KT3, when I, when I found out that the test was going in this direction, I was really excited about it because it allows me to really think about this test in the, in, the, in the span or in the course of a larger, more complex evaluation and how it fits in that regard. I don't know how many psychologists we have in the room uh, in the, on the, uh, the session with us today, 
are, who are looking at a little more detail at some of the cognitive aspects um, or the educational di diagnosticians who are um, partnering with psychology to look at co cognitive processing. Um, th these types of tests that allow you to do this and really allow you to make this connection um, are going to be very powerful for you. It's going to, and it's going to be help, more helpful too. Um, I know that, you know, typically in practice, I have to look at various tests um, and and decode or analyze what the tests are measuring. Um, this type of a system allows you to do that in a, with a little bit more clarity and a little bit more um, direction. Okay, so this is some of the things I really enjoy about these, this, this in specific, this qualitative indicators. Um, so, so when this comes out and you start to look at this, hopefully you'll find that this to be successful for you as well. Let's talk about the clinical model of assessment um, for KT3. But like the KT and the KT2, the, the KT3 was modeled um, and was developed from a model of clinical assessment in order to provide more, um, more than just profile or norm reference scores. So think about those qualitative indicators. It really is providing you with more than that um, than just those scores. In addition, the error analysis system, you know, we're able to look at errors that, th that a child or someone is making on the test. We're able to look at what those errors mean. The error analysis system does offer you a clear direction for instructional interventions. So you're able to look at interventions in a little bit more detail. So this clinical model of assessment really looks at more than just scores. We're looking at how um, we're looking at multiple points of data, but we're also looking at how, how can we make those scores meaningful or performance error analysis um, meaningful for interventions. So um, this is uh, just talking a little bit about why one of the areas of what, why this is so, um, why the KT3 does this really well, which are looking at subtests with similar formats, and that really does help you with comparative analyses. So the pairs of subtests, so we're looking at reading comprehension and listening comprehension, we're looking at written expression and oral expression, they were developed to have similar formats because you need to be able to compare and contrast performance on each of those. So reading comprehension and listening comprehension, you're able to compare um, uh, uh, input of both written and oral language. Uh, for written expression and oral expression, you're looking at the, the um, output of both written and oral language. Okay, so you're really... Those tests and the, and the reason why those were, were, were developed that way is so that you can more easily interpret performance and really compare and contrast those, those scores and those performances. And, um, yeah, I just have this note down here. I forgot to read that. But these comparisons really do help you distinguish between specific problems in reading and writing or more general language problems. Let's talk about interventions, and this is why it's important, the ability to uh, look at individual or compare those tests and look at individual strengths and weaknesses. Really, the reason is so that we can make more effective interventions or drive more effective interventions. But intervention statements are going to be provided with, uh, along with error analysis reports as part of that clinician report that we talked about through uh, QGlobal. And you're able to, to give teachers and clinicians helpful instructional recommendations. So based on a child's performance, strengths and weaknesses, we're really able to make more targeted intervention statements. Um, in addition, we do have parent intervention suggestions, and they're going to be part of a parent report. And uh, it really does give parents um, some fun, playful activities that they can use at home to strengthen their child's basic academic skills. So uh, we, you have that ability as well. Uh, when we're looking at the – I'm going to show you, again, like I talked about, there are teacher-parent there are teacher, parent, and child interventions. I'm going to talk a little bit about the parent ones right now, okay? I'm not going to give other information. Again, this is just some examples I wanted to show you just to give you a, a, a snapshot of what it's going to look like and the information that you're going to, that you're going to be able to get. But you'll, when you, um, you're going to have the, the option to select one or all of the domains for interventions, or you can allow the QGlobal scoring system to select uh, the subtests with standard scores below 85. So if you select Q Global to do it, all the subtests or all the tests that come out below 85, um, it will give you intervention statements for those. Or you could just select them specifically based on some questions that you know came in th coming through, like the referral questions or the pre-referral information. Here are some examples of some um, parent-child interventions that some intervention statements that you'll get. Again, these are just examples uh, for reading comprehension. So if we look at pre-K 
pre-K, grade K. Um, some of the suggestions for parents, read to your child with inflection and gestures to convey meaning. So uh, shiver and extend the sounds while reading. The ice mountain was so cold. I know I have a, I have a young daughter who's in pre-K right now, and I know that when I, whenever I read um, stuff, I always, I always do this just naturally, um, just to kind of get her more interested in what we're reading. But uh, the second one, read the same story repeatedly to allow your child to build his or her memory and see the benefits of repeated reading through his or her improved comp- uh, through his or her improved comprehension. And oftentimes, you know, we have books in the house that we'll read over and over again. And um, you know, when we ask a child or I ask my daughter to go get a book, she'll go get her favorite book and know the story and like the story. And re- reading a, uh, a book over and over again really does improve that, and it improves their understanding of what's going on in the story. Some suggested interventions for third through fifth grade would be um, if a child had difficulty with reading comprehension, you'd encourage your child to pre- preview new words before reading the text. Um, you can use an audio glossary or end of chapter glossary to, to preview chapter terms or pre teach words with them through discussing their meaning. Um, then you could also have your child see you use and access the dictionary. Uh, think aloud, I don't know the word. Um, I don't know that word. Let's look it up together. These are some examples of parent-child interventions for written expression. So third through fifth grade, if they have difficulty with written expression, engage your child in writing frequently for a variety of purposes. Thank you notes, birthday cards, holiday cards, invitations, etc. Um, have your child write shopping lists or search um, uh, and or search and check off needed items or list amounts needed from pre-printed list. For sixth through eighth grade, Get your child a planner that requires him or her to note important dates, after-school events, practices, homework, test dates, etc. Um, if they have difficulty with written expression, you may also want to have your child routinely write thank you notes, holiday cards, or update family blog with a short descriptive phrase. Some of this. Is, um, okay, that's what I had. Oh, you know, the reason I really wanted to show this to you is that. Um, Again, really the important thing when we're doing an evaluation, if a child is having difficulty in a specific area, is to make specific targeted intervention statements. And the reason is because if we're making them very specific and targeted based on what we're finding in terms of weaknesses and strengths, well, the, the interventions are going to be much more effective, right? So these parent-child interventions are just as important as, as the um, teacher in, interventions are. And I think that when we're looking at specific weaknesses based on grade and what we know about what happens in grades, um, you are, yes, you are going to uh, be a little bit more effective. The question is, are the suggested interventions evidence-based? Yes, they are. There, um, other research, other research findings will, will be, um, will be cited in the, in the manual. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about is, for the next couple of minutes, Common Core State Standards. Uh, CCSS, okay, otherwise known as, and I'm sure that most of you have heard of this, and there's um, there's some news recently out about Indiana and Common Core, but um, a lot of states are using common are following Common Core state standards, um, and um, just wanted to give some information about that in relationship to the KT3, okay. In terms of what they are, what are Common Core state standards? Uh, the goal of the initiative is to provide teachers and parents with a common understanding of what students are expected to learn and then also define the knowledge and skills students should have within their K-12 education careers. Many state assessments and curriculum-based measures are going to be designed to align closely to the Common Core um, to determine how well students have mastered these curriculum standards. So you know that a lot of state assessments that are out there now, depending, I'm I'm sure I have folks in here across the country, we have a lot of tests that states are developing specifically um, to measure areas of Common Core because they, they have a uh, a need to be able to make sure that children are making progress on that, right? So a lot of the state standards and curriculum-based measures are going to be um, aligned specifically to Common Core. What exactly is KT's relationship to Common Core state standards? Well, incorporating the skills identified by Common Core was going to it is or was one important consideration when the KT3 was being developed. Uh, many state assessments and curriculum-based measures. Um, like I talked about, are designed to align closely. Um, however, as an instrument that's used for clinical assessment, other considerations had to be made 
um, that were also valuable for developing KT3 content. Um, as was done for numerous other clinical assessments that are used in educational settings, the KT3 is designed to assess skills, um, those skills that are important for identifying academic areas of strengths and weaknesses and understanding and remediating learning difficulties and disorders. Many of the clinical, clinically sensitive skills that, I, that, that a clinical assessment such as the KT3 measures are also included in the, in the Common Core. Okay, so just because the KT3 was developed to specifically look at strengths and weaknesses um, in a clinical model, those skills are aligned. A lot of those are found, not aligned, but a lot of those are found in, com in the Common Core standards. And I'll give you an example. Um, narrative and expository error categories were added to the KT3 reading comprehension and listening comprehension subtests primarily because distinguishing between narrative and expository passages is important for identifying and remediating, remediating comprehension weaknesses. But um, also, the Common Core has standards for instruction with both types of text. So you see how the, you know, narrative and expository is important for, our, our, um, not, uh, for remediating weaknesses and identifying weaknesses in, in a sort of like the quote-unquote clinical fashion, but that is also aligned with is found in Common Core. Okay, in those types of text. So the, basically, the KT3 does align uh, with Common Core, but um, it's limited, and it's necessarily limited for, for two main reasons. Uh, first, the KT3 and other similar clinical assessments are not appropriate necessarily, or by themselves, are not necessarily appropriate venues for measuring many of the Common Core standards especially at the upper grade levels. Um, for example, uh, high school standards in a written domain include conducting a research project to answer a question and then writing fluently or writing routinely over an extended period of time for a specific purpose. Um, many standards like that are important for establishing grade basic expectations, but they're not measured by the KT3. Um, and the reasons are because they're not relevant to the purpose and intended use of the test. Um, or the skill would be d difficult to measure with a norm reference test. Okay. Secondly here, the second one you have listed here, is that the grade appropriate skills measured by the KT3 subtests do not map perfectly or precisely to the Common Core standards. For example, much of the content on the KT3 does align to domains in the early, middle, early elementary and middle school grades with relatively f fewer alignments or maps, um, uh, links to high school and level standards. So that's why um, it does, we do say that the KT3 aligns with it, but it's not, uh, it is limited, okay, it's not comprehensive. So yes, you're able to use KT3 data to make decisions um, regarding Common Core standards, but it doesn't map perfectly, and nor should it, and that's mainly because of these two reasons that we have listed here. Um, what I do want to say about that, though, is that, um, you, you know, uh, the, the KT3 does have a lot of content that is developmentally appropriate and academically challenging for examinees at higher grades and ability levels. And that's really reflected in the norms um, because the norms have good ceilings and uh, older examinees than adults for older examinees than adults on nearly every subtest. So just because we're not aligning to the upper grades um, or we're not mapping to the upper grades um, in a lot of the, the areas, doesn't mean that the KT3 isn't a strong test to use with older children um, and young adults. It is. Uh, it's just not mapping specifically to, to the Common Core standards. So really, if you think about the fact that um, KT3 doesn't have full correspondence to Common Core doesn't reflect a shortage of grade appropriate content. There is a a wealth of grade appropriate content that just doesn't map specifically to their standards. What I wanted to show you in this slide here is, um, this is again an example about um, Common Core and KT3 and how the test maps. So for the um, phonics and word recognition, you are seeing, a, a, under nonsense word decoding, you're seeing a, um, an alignment, not really necessarily an alignment, but you're finding a lot of the, the same information on the standards for uh, grades one through five. If you see in the reading comprehension, craft and structure, you are seeing how that maps on grades two through eight. Um, key ideas and details, one through seven, 
uh, phonics and word recognition one through five, etc. So this is just an example. Again, this is not exhaustive. I just wanted to show you some 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 rows from a general table that will be will be put together for um, for the manual. But what you're seeing here is that there are specific um, subtests in KT3 that does that that do align to specific areas in um, Common Core. Okay. And hopefully this will be helpful for you if you have specific areas or, 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 or specific areas of Common Core that you want to be evaluating and you want an additional point of data. Um, using the KT may help you with that additional point of data, but again, it's not going to, it's going to be limited. Okay, what I wanted to end by talking about real quick is some of the stuff that's coming soon. Um, the first one there, QGlobal, is the, again, like I talked about, the online scoring and reporting system. Um, you'll be able to use that to... to um, to put the scores in and, and print out a report for you. Um, what I wanted to talk about is um, for QGlobal, currently it's in a, um, if you're familiar with QGlobal, currently it's in a per a per report, uh, you pay per report. Um, but for, for this, for, for KT3 and QGlobal, we'll, we're going to be introducing a subscription-based model uh, for unlimited scoring during the term of a license of the user. So that's going to be um, introduced soon. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'm going to give you information about where to find it. Additionally, combo report. I have that as a, only a very small little bullet here because we don't have a lot of information uh, about it yet, but this is coming. Um, so I wanted, wanted to give you some information because I think it's a really neat feature, something that's going to be really helpful. But with the WISC-5, KT3, and, and Y3, we're looking at a combo report through QGlobal that's going to be able to integrate the findings. Um, so if a child was given each of those tests or given some of those tests, They'll be able to integrate the findings of, of those tests together to be able to help you drive diagnostic formulation and interventions a little bit more targeted fashion. So if, if you go back and think about what I talked about earlier with um, looking at all of the areas uh, of, of possible cognitive or processing weaknesses, um, you know, such a report will, will really help you do that in the future, okay? And also Q Interactive. I wanted to give you a, a sort of an upcoming information about Q, Q Interactive. Um, currently, we're looking at fall of 2014, but if you're not familiar with Q Interactive, just give you a quick update. It is a digital system that streamlines the entire assessment process. Um, uh, the clinician creates client profiles or student profiles, chooses and develops batteries, and then reviews scored, uh, scored data through a secure web portal. Basically, you administer the tests on two tablets. They talk to each other via Bluetooth connection. Um, the clinician uses one tablet to administer the instructions, record and score responses, take notes, and control the visual stimuli, and then the client or the student uses the other one to view and respond to stimuli. So basically, it's a format, it's a digital system to, um, to administer um, tests using two tablets. Really great stuff, really great information. Um, cool little system that you can use. For information on that, um, I'm just going to suggest you go to uh, helloq.com. You'll see this page right here, which is uh, one half is Q Global, one half is Q Interactive. You can select either one of those and get more information about either Q Global or Q Interactive. This is some other information here. If you want to talk to folks um, on the customer service for customer service information to learn a little bit more about Q, uh, KT3, Q Global, or Q Interactive, you can, you can call either of these numbers. There's the number at the top for, the, for uh, folks that are in the U.S. And if I have any um, folks from Canada on the line, I have the information down there at the bottom. Uh, the web address in the middle is the Pearson website, and just search for KT3, and you can get more information about that. Okay, so I have a couple minutes left. I have some questions in here. Just wanted to see if I can answer some of them um, as we go along. Okay. So what um, what subtests will be on Q Interactive for KT3? I don't have that information, um, Heidi, but I'm I'm uh, I would I'm pretty sure it would be most, uh, if not all, of the subtests. Um, it's usually I know for Y at three, all the subtests are now on there. So for KT3, I'm I'm pretty sure the plan is the exact same. But Michelle um, is on the Michelle is answering some questions now too. If she has a different information, if you could put that out as well, Michelle. But I think it's for, for Q Interactive, it's going to be all of the, the, the KT3 subtests. Um, if we, uh, question, if dropping occurs during administration of Q Interactive, what happens? 
Um, that doesn't happen often because it's a Bluetooth connection and you're right next to someone. Um, but if it does happen, the quick, it's easy to quick link back up and you don't lose your position. It basically saves your position. Um, it's not like, it's not like you lose position and you'd have to restart from the beginning. Um, if it happens to lose Bluetooth connection, you can log those back in very quickly. Um, what about interventions for gift, gifted, profoundly gifted students? Um, I don't have information about that right now, Shirley. Um, I will look for that information to see whether or not that's coming. Can this be used with ESL children? Um, it, yes, sure. Well, so, so best practice for anybody that has um, ESL children with the, in the ESL, um, yes, you should you should be able to evaluate a child in both um, their native language as well as as English. Um, if you're looking at specifically academics, I would suggest um, the KT3 is probably a good a good measure for that. Some other questions in here. Um, I see some other questions in here that I don't have answers to right now. But what I'll do is, and since we're over our time limit, I'll look at some of the questions that I haven't been able to answer um, that came through, and I will uh, I'll put together a question a Q and a, a document and then send it out to you guys. Okay. So um, some of the questions that came through I don't have specific answers to, but I know folks in the development team may. All right, so I'll look at that information, and I'll send you out a Q&A document. All right, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Otherwise, I hope everybody has a great day, and um, I'll talk to you guys again soon.